The nation is mourning the deaths of several women and girls who were murdered by men. Holding the steak knife that he had been using, he jumped to his feet and rushed at me. That night when I put in my statement, one of the officers at the police station says, oh, you know what, we don't have the time for this. We know the names of Uyine and Mkhechana, Leandre Jechels, Janika Mallo, Ayaka Gianni, and her three little siblings. But we also grieve for the many others who have died at the hands of men. There was physical abuse, verbal abuse, and emotional abuse. Violence against women has become more than a national crisis. It is a crime against our common humanity. South Africa has amongst the world's highest femicide rates. While leaving an abuser may be an option for those in abusive relationships, it's not always a safe one. This is Him or Me, a podcast series on the experiences of women who have faced abuse and their experiences with the South African criminal justice system. I'm your host, Lele Tutonis. My name is Charlene Peters. I was arrested in 2005 for possession of cannabis. I was framed by my ex-boyfriend. The following narration is based on correspondence sent to the Vitz Justice Project. We have changed the names of the parties involved to protect their identities. Charlene Peters met her former partner in the year 2000. We'll call him Mark. They dated and had a child together, but the relationship quickly became toxic. Mark was abusive. This is Charlene's story. I met Mark early 2000 and we dated on and off for quite some time, five years. Things were good at first, maybe the first year and a half, but in my memory, there was so much abuse that I can hardly remember the good times we had. Despite staying in the abusive relationship, Charlene told her parents about the abuse. Her parents were supportive and urged her to leave Mark. But leaving isn't always easy for women in abusive relationships. In Charlene's case, Mark was also the father of her son. The abuse, however, got worse. There was physical abuse, verbal abuse, and emotional abuse. It affected me so badly that I eventually quit my job in late 2003. I was working as a teacher at that time. Anyway, in 2005, I got a job in Limpopo, and I was so happy to finally leave everything behind and start afresh. Charlene finally ended her relationship with Mark. But because of their son, she had to inform him that they will be moving to a new province. What Charlene had not considered was the extreme measures an abuser may resort to in order to prevent their victim from leaving. You know, the funny thing is, when I told Mark about it, he was very nice and he even offered to take my son and I to the airport. You know, they say hindsight is... 2020. Yeah, now I know why he was so nice and helpful. After all those times when he threatened to kill me if I left, I should have smelled a rat. I was ready with my bags packed and my son and I were really looking forward to our new life in a different province. Anyway, he dropped us off at the airport and just when we were entering domestic travels, a group of men in all black surrounded my son and I. They demanded to check my bag and I let them. I mean, it's not like I had anything bad in there. But I was very surprised when they pulled out a huge bag of dacha from my bag. I was so confused and even then it didn't dawn on me that the stuff was placed there by Mark. Earlier that morning, he had taken my bag a few times, saying he just wants to help me pack. I thought he was being nice because... He was feeling emotional about the fact that things are really over between us. Or 
Maybe he felt he could change my mind by being nice to show me that he still cared about me and didn't want to lose me. Anyway, after they found that huge bag of weed, they obviously detained me. Luckily, my parents knew everything that had been going on between Mark and I. So social services told me I have to sign my son over to someone else while I am in custody. My parents found me a lawyer, but I was denied bail because of the size of that bag of dacha. But, you know, there were so many people who couldn't afford bail for 200 rand, for example. For many South Africans, bail is unaffordable. People who have been apprehended in connection with a crime can spend months and even years waiting in remand detention. This is due to failures in the justice system. Often, court cases are postponed. At times, police lose files and dockets related to the case. In several cases that Vitz Justice has witnessed, the process has meant that people could spend more than eight years just waiting for their case to be heard. All the while, these awaiting trial prisoners are deemed innocent as they have not been found guilty by a court of law. Charlene was fortunate enough to afford legal representation. As a result, she spent just three days in detention. She describes this period as the worst experience of her life. I could afford bail because of my parents, but I just wasn't granted bail. It was very sad to see all the people who were there for petty crimes, like stealing food items. It's not fair that hungry people must be punished for trying to feed their children. Anyway, the lawyer demanded a list of all the people who contacted the airport on that day and... Mark came up. Apparently, he even described exactly what I was wearing from head to toe. Now at the holding cells, it was the worst experience ever. Firstly, it was extremely overcrowded. Very, very poor hygiene. We hardly had any food to eat, even though the food itself was terrible. They basically just gave us bread and some watery mishmash that was almost like soup, I chose to go hungry instead. There were no blankets or pillows. I had to trade some of my clothes and the shoes I was wearing in return for a pillow and a blanket. The toilets were absolutely filthy. No one cleaned them and the smell was unbearable. The smell was the worst part. You can ignore hunger to a certain extent. You can accept the poor living conditions, being overcrowded in a small space, But the smell, you can't escape it. There is nothing you can do to escape that smell. I think I spent about two and a half days there putting up with that smell. Worst of all, there was a pregnant woman who had a very bad smell coming from her. The other women were saying that the baby had rotted inside her because it smelled like rotten meat. She was eight months pregnant and we kept telling the guards they must get medical attention for her because it was obvious something was very wrong inside her body. They just made her bath, but that didn't help with the smell. I spoke to some women who were there, and some were saying they were arrested for stealing things like bread. Others were there for more serious crimes. But everyone was kept in that same overcrowded cell. According to South Africa's white paper on remand detention management, all detained persons have a right to basic human rights such as food and nutrition, health care and sanitation. The paper also states the following. Remand detention should never be used to penalise or punish any person. Remand detention occurs as a result of an order of a court of law. Remand detention should be managed in accordance with the highest possible ethical and professional standards. Some people were there for murder, some for grand theft auto, some were there for other petty crimes, but there was no distinction between people who might be dangerous and people who were harmless. I was very scared. 
I thought I couldn't live through it if I didn't get out as early as I did. I heard this story about a boy who got TB and died. And later I found out that it is very common for people to get TB in prison and holding cells. There is no justice for those people, you know, because they can't afford it. Their families can't afford to access justice. So as tough as those two days were, I was very lucky to have parents that have money. The lawyer cost about 20000 for each part of the process. Altogether, my parents ended up paying close to 100000 After two days, I went to court and I was lucky enough to be released. But I didn't get my son back until I had completed a number of tests to prove that I wasn't on drugs. It took about five months to do this. My parents wanted to sue my ex, but I told them I don't want to go through that whole process again. It's not fun having to go to court and talk about my painful experiences. And my parents had already spent so much money. It was going to cost more to sue. So we let it go. Charlene's trauma extended beyond the abuse she faced at the hands of her partner. The first point of entry into the correctional services proved to be one of the many failures within South Africa's criminal justice system, the impact of which is long-lasting post-traumatic stress. Her efforts to rebuild her life meant she had to work through the trauma associated with years of gender-based violence and that of the unforgettable horror of pre-trial detention. If I didn't have my parents, my life would have been completely ruined. And to think there are so many people whose lives have been ruined over small, petty crimes, it's heartbreaking. It was definitely the worst experience of my life. I suffered post-traumatic stress for the longest time. You know, they call it correctional centers, but no one gets corrected there. It's just how on earth. This is Him or Me, a podcast series on the experiences of women who have faced abuse and their experiences with the South African criminal justice system. I'm your host, Lele Tutonis. The Vitz Justice Project investigates human rights abuses and miscarriages of justice related to the criminal justice system. You can get in touch with us by visiting our website at www.vitzjusticeproject.co.za or Vitz Justice Project on Facebook and on Twitter. Special thanks to Yonaka Teledi for providing narration services for this episode.